Yo, what is good, everybody? This is Kayla Moorhead. Yo, this is Cameron Luck. And yeah, we're just happy to see you guys today. Not actually, because we're coming to you through some speakers. But Yo, anyway. how you like the video intro- or the audio introduction? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So kind of All some right. backstory on us. Yeah, we're just some designers. We've been working in the industry for seven or eight years. Mm. And we just wanted to start this off trying to Do kick it around about design. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's like we, we figured we've done a lot of different things in the past together. And uh, I think given that we are both in UX design and seen a lot and done a lot, you know, we really wanted to try and put some information out there about uh, what UX design is, what it's about, what it's like to do this day in and day out and sort of like what it takes to get to a more senior place in your career to get to, you know, larger tech companies and to be in the kind of places that, uh, you know, a lot of people dream to work at. Totally. Yeah. That makes sense. I think like the biggest thing we're trying to do is, I mean, we're just going to kick it and talk some design shop and stuff like that, but we're really and, trying to help you guys. And make references to Future and Drake a lot. <laughs> Most, Yeah, that's true. Any sort of hip-hop references will definitely be made. Probably hip-hop, movie references. Video games. Yeah, but movies, we're really here to help you get a clear lens on like what design looks like, especially at larger companies, kind of what, what right. Kalen said. We've been around. Um, and really, like how I think we really want to give back in our ideas and opinions on how to get to where we got how to enter the industry um, mm. and really just help break the walls down uh, to, to understanding what this industry is and, and how to do what we've done. It's not something that's unattainable for anyone. Um, so yeah, we just want to make sure that you're getting something interesting in your ears every Yo, few weeks. Get that flavor in you. That ear. flavor in your ear and we'll keep <laughs> it, keep it riding. Get that one, do that one for Craig Mack. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, get some. We might some get n- some beats on here. Who, hey, who knows? <laughs> Got some beats queued up. As long as uh, we don't get flagged on YouTube. Oh, shoot, you get flagged for anything. I was going to say, hey, but I made them, but you know, you can get flagged for anything we'll these still days. Get <laughs> exactly. We'll still get flagged. So, you know, hopefully we'll drop some knowledge and uh, keep you entertained while we're here. Yeah, feel free to hit us up with any questions and have a good time. In the meantime, let's go. So yeah, our our questions for the evening. Uh, what are misconceptions around user experience design? Um, you know, having been in the field for a number of years, I would certainly say that like user experience is so often defined as this very like pixel pushing sort of uh, aspect of design, um, just like making sure that we can have wireframes and deliverables, um, things that are going to be like these artifacts that people are going to need just to like sell a pitch to somebody. Right. Yeah. That's definitely the, uh, the concept that I've seen a lot, especially when you're working with like product managers or other types of people that think you're just there to kind of visualize ideas. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think a lot of the times in my experience, I've seen just a number of people who too often sort of mix uh, visual design into user experience design and think that like, just because we also use Adobe products that we are going to be making like these awesome graphical, like displays in my maps. I guess right. that's fair though, at a certain point, because like you can look at yeah. visual, yeah. visual design as part of UX, but it's not, the entire yeah. it's it's the tip of the iceberg right it is it, i think the larger problem is because user experience is a field but like at but it's also a role in a company right and so it's like if you're looking at this what was it that uh iceberg of ux like yeah. there are certain things that are at the top of it as far as like the things you see like interaction design information architecture visual design copy but like there's a lot that goes behind that too and that they also a lot of the different practices and different roles that you would see within a company and a larger corporation certainly like visual design uh user researchers uh copywriters um fairly a fairly diverse array of different roles are all actually parts of the user experience right the iceberg analogy is funny because if you just steer towards the things that are visible, you're definitely going to sink your ship. 
<laughs> so I'm like, <laughs> that is true. <laughs> That's what that, I find funny. It, it, it's some very Titanic stuff. So <laughs> yeah, definitely don't recommend that one because I, I, I think the other problem is I know the two of us uh, in our experience have just had a lot of times where there's uh, because there's like that mix up in terms of like what it is that we do as user experience and like coming up with mocks and thinking that that's like, you know, like visual comp things. And like, given that we both work at, you know, these large corporations, we it, it's usually like that's a whole other department. There's like an art department <laughs> exactly. that, that actually it's does do that people. stuff. Right. Yeah. The thing that's awkward, too, that I think is like one of the big misconceptions about like how design is supposed to be executed is the fact that like this is the only role that I've seen or that I've been in where other people are telling you how to execute your role. You know what I'm saying? It's like, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, you guys do the mock ups. You do the visual portion of this. Like, I'm not telling you how to write your business requirement. Doc. Right. I'm not telling you like, oh, you do the coding. Doing, part of the- I'm not doing Gantt charts. Right. Know? Exactly. Like, I'm not dictating deliverables. So it's really not- awkward to be in a situation where like people right. feel like they know what they're talking about to you and right. they're trying to dictate deliverables. And nine times out of 10, you have to like take that, understand what they're trying to do and like blow it up 10 times what they're saying to yeah. get close to what they're trying to do. Yeah, and you know, I I, I recognize that's something that you're going to get really in any profession, any role is a certain level of people who try to like overstep and tell you how to do your friggin' job. But at the same time, it's like it is a very prevalent thing it, with pretty much every designer I've yeah. I've ever known. <laughs> it's too visible, it right? Is. And I think like the interesting thing too is like when you originally asked around like what are some of the misconceptions, right? Mm-hmm. So I think one of the clear ones that I see in some corporations and some are better than others. People have this like fundamental misunderstanding that user experience design, because it has the term design in it is not technical. Yes. And I'm like, this is a technical role and you have to be, you have to be someone that can understand tech business design And a Mm. number of other factors like human psychology and things to be Mm. able to make these things work. And I've seen a lot of the time, like there's misconceptions that you're not technical and you're not going to work with the technical people. There's misconceptions that you don't need to know the business constraints or the business goals. Like I'm working on Mm. a project right now where I went and asked, Hey, what are the business goals for this, um, this feature that you guys want to launch? And they're like, either we don't know, or UX doesn't need to know that. I'm like, whatever you guys decide, are your we business goals like strategically shifts how we're going to execute on this design? Yes. Do we put it very forefront? Do we put it very in the back? Do we hide it? Do we show it? Is it a primary feature? Is it a secondary feature? Right. We right. don't have any of those understandings without clear business goals and clear business metrics. You know what I'm saying? So like, yeah, it's super awkward to see just such a lack of understanding around like your business partners. Because I don't know what their benefit is to like not answering those questions. You know what I'm saying? They're like, oh, yeah, we're not. We don't need to know the business goals. Right. Just design it. Right. And Do you like, know what that means, sir? We we are. We still work with the same company. Like we're still trying to no. it's achieve the same. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, no, this is very exactly. totally opposite. Wrong. Wrong. Right. So, but yeah, it's like, you know, if we're all at the same company with the same goal, it's like, I want to have a job at the end of the day too. Like I, I want to go home and like have a paycheck. And so it's like, it is important to me also that the company does well. And I know <laughs> I, I always preach that like, I'm an advocate for users. I am here as like the voice of the user, but to the same, at the same time, it's like, yeah, but the company hired me. Like I, right, I, exactly. I, I, I have to take everybody's input here and I'm not just going to do stuff just because it's, you know, always the best thing for the user. There are right. things that we as a company, like, you know, need from this product, from this feature, from like whatever. Or you're not doing it, right? You're exactly. not doing it. It's not getting funded as a project exactly. if there's not a business school. The thing that, like, kind of to that point, and this might be another misconception, is I've seen a lot of people discussing, like, the difference between UX design and product design recently. Mm-hmm. And it just seems to me, this is what I think, my yeah. opinion, is everybody that was in UX is just fleeing to the product design terminology because yeah ux is too saturated with visual designers and other types of people Mm -hmm. and so now they're like oh product design is where you go and you mix more product strategy and user needs that was ux like that's exactly what that is it's like any good designer is looking at business tech and user Mm -hmm. constraints and they're Mm -hmm. balancing them to come up with the best user experience in the simplest 
possible fashion that meets the goals of the the business and is mm-hmm. delivered on time. That's literally exactly. what user experience is. So I'm kind of just like, we keep fragmenting the terminology, which to some people it feels like they're benefiting themselves, but to other people it's just driving more confusion with all it, these all of your like peers that don't know what you're doing. It's driving confusion. I think it's messing up the like actual marketplace for designers right. and like a lot of other stuff with that too because i you know i think what you were saying before is like ux has been you know often overrun in terms of like bamboo design it's a heist <laughs> <laughs> hoodwinks yeah, exactly <laughs> no I, like they've it, taken it from all me. this poppycock yeah, exactly. <laughs> like but it, it's honestly and i don't say this to like be completely at the detriment of like visual design. I think visual design is a very complicated process and practice. And right. I do respect people who, you know, have that skill and that ability. And I think they are a very important component of what we do, but that is different than what we do. Right. And so many times I feel like I've seen, um, you know, we, we've really been in the workforce as far as design, you know, in the UX field for the last like seven years. And in that time, it really there were a lot of people who came in in the early parts of that where that were just people who were coming from like visual design components or coming right, from right. like you know marketing and advertising design uh stuff and just like transitioning to this like online thing and they're like we're just gonna do this because you know there's right. money it in looks this the now. same too and yeah, yeah and like because in the early stages people companies didn't really know what to look for right they were hiring people based on their graphical ability based still on the do. kind of, and the, i mean yeah i'm just i'm not gonna say that's not still a thing but it's that was predominantly like one of the biggest issues i saw was that you had to present a lot of these like really flashy interfaces and everything had to be you know super stylized all this you know cool looking stuff but at the end of the day it wasn't actually a good user experience. Right. Or it didn't have a business goal or something like that. Like that. Yeah. It's interesting because I've seen a lot of things that are good user experiences that the product failed. You know what I'm yeah. saying? It's like, yeah, oh, yeah. That's, that's great. But it's like, okay, you didn't actually Very succeed. Soon. And the thing that people don't understand a lot of times, they're like, oh, yeah, I, I hit all the user needs. I made this good user experience. If your business crashes, your user experience is gone. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, you're making downstream problems. And I think one, one of the things you, you said that's really, like, key in is, Visual design is a component of user experience design. And what I've yeah. seen is so many visual designers have transitioned into UX because it looks like an easy transition. Yeah. In reality, like we're not putting a bar up there to say like, oh, here's all the skills that you need to build to be there. You need to know how to do research. You need to know how to do all these other things, mm-hmm. which I'm okay with that. But at the same time, the real problem was visual designers were not paid enough. Like, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's the actual problem. That's like if, if we had all of our visual designers paid a- appropriately, they wouldn't feel like they had to make this jump. You know what I'm saying? It's right, like right. that role is valuable. I would love yeah. to do all the UX parts and hand it over to that role to really yeah. do that part of the user experience and, and amplify it better than I can. You right. know, so like I think the problem didn't even come down to like, oh, we had these visual designers that wanted to move over. They didn't want to move over. They got forced no. to move over because they're yeah. getting paid half of what they should have been paid. Because so it's like, not considered technical. Right. And that's where that same mindset came from, right? Where it's like, oh, we hired in all these visual people that had the UX title, and now they mm-hmm. think everybody's a non-technical designer. Mm-hmm. And I'm sitting here, we're both graduates of a tech school. Yes. And we go into the workforce expecting to do certain things like, oh, we need to, to connect with these developers that run right. Agile, and we're going right. to have to deep dive into their code right. pipeline to understand how our front end is going to work. Right. And then like the right. expectation is like, go make a mock-up. I'm like, dude, what are? how is like, that going to get the product out? Can I go talk to the developers? No. Why? <laughs> you don't need to know them. You don't stay in your cage, Caitlin. They, <laughs> <laughs> they stay in theirs. Right, exactly. <laughs> like, it's, it, it, it felt almost... I, I think particularly in the earlier days of like doing this, like the fact that we're only and, like, not even 30 and we're sitting here talking about the earlier days is ridiculous. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the fact that I've like, I had a 10 year high school reunion this past year was blew my mind. So yeah, but yeah, that's it, ridiculous. Right. It, but yeah, to it's the, a whole nother to story. The, <laughs> yeah. To the UX <laughs> point at least, you know, I, I think, there is the fact that it's like visual design is an important component. I understand like why people say it's not like it's not a tech role, but that doesn't mean that it should be undervalued in terms of what it can bring to the tech. Uh, I think they're wrong though. You know what I'm saying? Cause like if you're executing a visual design, right, especially today, right? Like Mm -hmm. nowadays we have all these people that are working on 
design systems, right? And everyone's yeah. got their own design system and they're yeah. creating design. It's so a lot of it is visual design visual languages. languages. Yeah. And they're pushing those across like all these different tech stacks and all these different products. I'm saying mm-hmm. like visual design has even elevated from where it was. Cause at one point mm-hmm. I could understand why you thought like, Oh, if I got a visual designer, we, they can do the UX, right? Because at right. one point apps were just bare bones. And if any sort of designer touched it, it automatically made it a better UX. Because there was at least one person thinking about what people liked or what they would. And that's not what UX is even about. Mm -hmm. But that visual designer was like, oh, this is a cool aesthetic, right? And they would apply it and that would make your app stand out. So in that that day and age, that was enough UX to get you from from, uh, not competing to to being the winner, right? And the the problem is the mindset hasn't caught up to the shift in the market. I I think that's true. Is that does that make sense? Because I'm yeah. kind of like the shift, the market shifted. Everybody started having decent UX, and everybody now has design systems that are published that people can use. Mm-hmm. iOS has design systems. Mm-hmm. Google Material has design systems. There's like a thousand design systems that you can it's just like, download off the internet and use immediately that are already pre-designed visually. Yeah. But you know what? If I go download those, you go download those. Any developer goes and downloads those, uses those UI components. Their application still has a poor UX. Why? Mm-hmm. Because it's way more value than that. And that's exactly. exactly what we're getting at. And it's like, and when you have these people who create these entire systems and then like unleash them into the world, it, but it, if like a, des- a developer were to take that, but didn't actually like, I don't know, read the friggin' instruction manual or like right. the style guides and stuff like that. Like you don't understand when you're supposed to use certain things and how you're right. supposed to use certain things and why you use certain things. And the reason that those are in place, the reason that like those had to be developed is because we needed consistency. We needed to, right. to ensure like cohesive experiences and that there are certain things that have gone in to the, that have gone into inform those design decisions and those design systems. And so like when you're just coming in here, just picking stuff that you just think seems cool or like works for whatever reason, like that it, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> right like i think that's kind of like this is a tangent but i kind of think that's the problem with dribble you know what i'm saying yeah, yeah. it's like it's a very good place to kind of go for like design porn and yeah go and see a lot of really <laughs> awesome looking things but like oh there's a reason all those designers aren't shipping like the next great product right because like mm-hmm. there is a even as a ux designer that we've done visuals we know how to do visual design yeah when I there's a whole process where like I might spend eighty five percent of the time on a project doing research and executing on concept level designs and iterating, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. I only spend like ten to fifteen percent, maybe even less actually, doing that visual portion, and then I spend the extra five to ten percent that's left over mm-hmm. iterating again, doing like <laughs> testing and iterations, you know, because like that portion is so small and it's really like once you find something that works and everybody that's in design and really does ux understands this but it's like the easy way to explain it is around it's like the house building model you know what i'm saying (laughs) there's an architect there's a guy that Mm -hmm. there's people that plan the the how the foundation is going to be built there's builders that come in and build it and then somebody comes in and paints it at the end if you're the UX person or you're on a team of UX people, you're doing everything but the painting. And then on most teams, you're also doing the painting. So it's and, like, you know, it's I, I would certainly say to I don't know, to even to refine that, I feel like you are the architect or maybe even like sort of the general contractor where yeah. you're, you're, you're the, the person who's sure. you're coordinating a lot of this stuff. And like you're coming up with these plans, these you know grandiose plans on what this thing is going to do and look like and whatever. But then you have to like sit there and explain to the people who are developing it, who are building it, like, here's how this goes. Here's why this goes this way. It has to be done a certain way because right. X, Y, Z. And when you get to the people as far as doing, you know, putting paint and stuff on there, you're like, this is going to go here. This has to be blocked off that way. We needed to do this because we wanted to brighten the room this way. Or, right, you know, right. Whatever. Or accentuate this feature of the yeah. house. And We so picked these materials for these reasons. Like all exactly, those. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I had and a so, really funny moment when you were like, oh, yeah, we need to come up with a plan. I was just like, stay scheme. <laughs> <In my head. laughs> the whole time you were talking. So I missed half of what you said. But I get you. I get exactly what you're saying. <laughs> I believe that. <laughs> I fully believe that. <laughs> the funny thing to me is, like everything you just said it it's so true and it makes you like i think one of the misconceptions going back to the original conversation here is like Mm. i think when you're in school or you're about to graduate or even for us we didn't even really know about ux till after the fact but like when you're going into ux so many people focus on the design elements and the design Mm. like output 
like, yeah. oh, I'm going to make all these cool wireframes and mm. prototypes and designs, X, Y, Z. But so much of it goes back to selling your ideas. Yes. And I'm like, I feel like, and that's one of the misconceptions that we're kind of getting at is like, you are that person that's selling the ideas and kind of getting the team behind you to build it. Because like mm -hmm. a lot of those people you need, like the builders in this kind of general contractor model, that's your mm -hmm. devs, right? You have to get them yeah. excited to do it, yeah. but they're not going to do it. They'll, right. they'll do a number of things to push back on you and yeah. not ex execute what the vision is, right? So it's it's this massive like, like why? selling. And, Wait, what? <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, they'll do the thing where it's like, oh, yeah, you know what? Um, here's the MVP. And you've already done all the tech scoping. And you're like, oh, here's yeah. the MVP. And then they're like, that's 9,000 days. I'm like, that's not 9,000 <laughs> days, dude. I could do this. <laughs> <laughs> but you you know what I'm talking about. They just scope it incredibly crazy so they don't right. have to do it because they don't like it. <laughs> but I'm like, the problem the problem I think is like nobody's prepared for that. Like when you yeah. first go into your design roles, you're like, oh, I need yeah. to learn sketch. I need to learn framer. I need right, to learn right. envision. I need to learn all these things. Now you need to learn how to talk to people. Like so much as soft skills and selling you, ideas. You need to be able to talk to like people of different backgrounds and like different expertises. Like yeah. you need to be able to talk to other designers. You need to be able to talk to technical people and developers. And you need to be able to talk to like business people and PMs. Right. Because they you have to work with because that's basically like that's your trifecta that you were talking about earlier. Like it's the way I was trying to think of it, I something I was gonna say earlier was like how they say there's like three components to a fire so it's like oxygen fuel and like ignition sure and yeah like if you want fire designs like in ux <laughs> you gotta <laughs> look at these metaphors bro but um, if Bars. you want <laughs> if you want that you gotta have like actual uh design business and technical stuff like and technical skill and if you have like a design sense and you can work with the business and make it, you know, actually profitable and then work with the developers to understand the tech behind it and like how you build out on it, then that's how you build actual user experiences. Right, like, right. It's interesting because it. what you just said, like, and I was thinking of it as you were talking, is kind of like um, there's a lot of things that don't visually look good that are that meet that criteria. Yes. And I think the, one of the easiest things to think of, like, what does it like? Oh, a user need a technical bar, a business need right. Craigslist. Yeah. Everybody tries to redesign exactly Craigslist. On my mind. Right. Everybody wants to visually redesign Craigslist. I did that in college. That was, like yeah, this you year. did. <laughs> you don't need like Craigslist's biggest thing. Anytime you see someone on a redesign Craigslist, they just put images everywhere, right? Right. And anytime you you see that like they don't believe in that like there's a reason that that doesn't exist but it's a good example and we can dive mm -hmm. deeper into that kind of thing later but i'm just right, like it, right. it, what you're saying about like making this kind of trifecta it's it's interesting because if you go into any environment kind of as a as a user experience designer mm -hmm. one of those pillar one of those legs on that table is always broken like one of them's not oh, sinking yeah. or like or <laughs> or all of them are not sinking yeah. you know so like you're a lot of the time you are and as much as what you're really talking about is like we all as designers understand that we need to empathize with our users, right? Like, oh, yeah, right. we need to go out and learn right. about the customer problem. We need to right. empathize. We need to dive deep. We need right. to kind of walk in their shoes. Right. You have to do that with all of your peers also. Yes. So you have to empathize with every single one of them, see where they're coming from, and build their trust to get on your side mm -hmm. or else you're not going to be able to even – achieve what Do the users are saying anything. yeah because you have no influence right so i'm like yeah. it's this really crazy tactical sales pitch model that you're constantly in where you're like right. trading uh kind of like emotional <laughs> currency or social <laughs> currency yeah, yeah with people all the time just to get ideas in and out and it's this really awkward thing that like no one really prepares you for no and i mean i you know i think coming from technical from a technical college like that wasn't necessarily something that we focused on. That wasn't something that, like... Oh, you're, the you're, complete you're, opposite. I mean, yeah, they're not going to tell you in, like, the College of Computing that you need to be worried about, like, trying to get how to get buy-in from senior leadership. Like, that's... <laughs> right, that's, exactly. That's, that doesn't exist in there. Yeah, and build if you it. want, if you Honestly, yeah. if you want that kind of experience, you have to go to, like, a business program right, or, right. like, business classes or whatever. And I actually do recommend that. You know, when I was um, when I was in college, I did organizational, organizational behavior classes, yeah. OB. And that was... Uh, it was kind of eye opening to me because it talks about a lot of like the qualifications and the traits of people who, you know, become leaders and leaders within companies um, and how like, you know, emotional empathy is uh, a more it's more highly valued than I think people give it credit for. Right. right. And emotional that, intelligence. Like, 
Right. Emotional intelligence. Thank you. And so the, the thing for me that one example that sticks out was um, talking about like they had an example of what do you do when you have a employee who's be who's like, you know, not performing well. And I remember I and someone else in the class said something to the effect of like, well, you need to fire them or let them go or, you know, give them you know penalties or da da da. And someone else was like, you should ask them what's wrong. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> and you're like, oh. Something changed, right? Yeah. Right. You're like, if this, especially if this person was a high performer, they're like, wait, what's going on? Like, what's what's wrong? And the teacher's like, exactly. You need to be figuring out like what it is with this particular individual that they aren't being productive anymore that right. they aren't able to like, you know, they aren't doing what they need to do. And so that's just a key component of what you have to do in a corporate setting. You can have all the design acumen, all the technical skill in the world, but if you can't work with the people who you are working with, then you don't have a shot at it. Honestly. Right. Yeah. It's interesting. Cause I've seen a lot of the time too, kind of piggyback on what you're saying is you mentioned this a bit earlier. It's like, Oh, the UX designer is like the customer advocate, right? Yeah. And you're coming in and you're like, oh, yeah, I'm trying to really advocate for the customer. Yeah. I see so many designers. And honestly, it's more senior designers. Um, but I see a mixture of this. Like so many designers are trying, tro- trying so hard to advocate for the customer that mm-hmm. they miss the business and technical needs. And they try to run mm-hmm. over their peers like, mm-hmm. oh, like the tech team, you need to build this. It doesn't matter what your estimates are. Sometimes mm-hmm. they are pushing back or giving you some nonsensical estimates, but sometimes they just don't have the bandwidth or they can't build it. That's true. And you have to be able to sniff those out. Other times, like people are pushing back because they don't understand something. You have to sniff that out and do it. But at a certain level, like I've literally seen people try to override business goals with customer needs. And I'm like, there's there's a time and a place to have that discussion. Yeah. But you can't keep pushing designs forward that are going to make a business loss or are like too too high of a risk to really understand, especially in like right. a scale of certain companies I've worked in. Yeah. Like if you ship a change that breaks, you're off, you're losing millions that day. So I'm like, that's not like if we were in a startup, yeah. dude, ship whatever you want, bro. Like we're gonna <laughs> see what happens. We don't have nothing out yet. That's it's like fine. we ain't done nothing, We've so done nothing. might as well do yeah. something. And that risk reward like changes over time, right? And that's right, what people right. really need to understand is if you're going into a large organization working on key products, you're not changing everything. So I know like there's this that's one of the misconceptions yeah. again. Yeah, like move oh fast yeah, and break stuff. Mentality. Yeah, like no, you're not doing that. Like you can move fast and break your stuff, but don't break on <laughs> like you know what I'm saying? Like what's going to happen in reality? You want to join a Facebook and Amazon and Google. Right. And you're like, "Oh, I'm going to redesign uh Facebook." No, you're not. <laughs> you're going to go in there and you're going to have some to deep dive in analytics for in a fact, year. <laughs> In fact, if you interview there, they tell you don't redesign Facebook. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you're not going to be able to. And even if you think you are, like that is a five year project. You know exactly. what I'm saying? Exactly. And you're going to be I, around LSEP, like uh, all kinds of leadership and all kinds of senior, type, designers and, senior designers. And, yeah. Right, 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 right. And, you know, I think one thing that had kind of been coming to me and that you touched on was like this idea of like long term planning. And so right. I, I, I think. We're getting to a point where or the thing that starts to like make a difference as you're in your career longer is you do move away from the like the more of like the studio model of just like I make wireframes. I make, you know, yeah, uh, I make designs. Yeah, and I execute thinking, and thinking in terms of like systems and the other part of systems is like long term planning for what the system will become. Right. Scalability. Like, Right. And long term planning for like what it is that you want out of this system. And so you have to understand like the idea of phasing in things. And right, right. sometimes you have to and to get a, to get some buy in, you just have to say, all right, here's, you know, here's my grandiose plan long term. I know this is unachievable. Yeah. This is, you know, we don't have you're to talk about a beautiful mind meeting. That's what Seriously. you're talking about. This is what I call Seriously. this. I'm like every single time I've done, like, it's like, here's my vision. Here's my grand plans. And you're just sitting there literally like yeah. mapping out everything. Yeah. You got like, you know, yarn connected stuff from one corner of the room to the other. And nobody's, you know, nobody sees the same stuff you're talking smells about. Smells like old gym socks. <laughs> <laughs> just like, you've been in here a minute, bro. Yeah. It's right. <laughs> but yeah, you know, it's like in Tastes the midst like of ideas. your... <laughs> <laughs> oh, mm, sour. That's a nasty. Yeah, it, 
<laughs> but yeah, it's like you go through all of that and you want to like you have this big idea and you to sell somebody on that. It's like a great thing. But you also have to present to them like, OK, here's the roadmap to how we get right. there, because we're not going to be able to like do this whole thing. There's a old saying my dad always told me was, you know, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? So you just like start with something small, start with a few key changes and things that you know that you can build off of later. Sounds like a Drake song. Start with it a few actually. key changes and start building. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. uh, honestly, that's Whitney Houston more than anything else. That is else. Whitney Houston. Yo, she'd be hitting like three key changes in the song. Like, I'm fine with girl. that. Or it's a oh, I beat. love it. I love it. Any, any Kendrick Lamar beat. <laughs> <laughs> I just love how it's like, I love just any rap song where there's just like a complete beat change in the middle of the song for no damn reason. Yeah. And you're just like, oh, I guess we decided to just like rap on both beats that the That's that song I was just singing a second ago. Yeah. The freaking Drake, the life is good. Well, yeah, That's literally yeah. he just he just finishes, he's like, I'm done with this song and he does the future rap the rest of the He's just like, hey, I'm gonna put this on a different verse or a different ridiculous. Beat. And if they could sell that vision, you can sell your vision. <laughs> but anyway, back to the main point. If, if life could be good for Drake and Future, it could be good yeah, for exactly. you too. Yeah, that's the that's the next the topic though. Dirty Sprite too. The the funny thing about that is like I work on a lot of teams where I'm like having to help set vision for the product or vision for like in any project you join, you're setting vision on it. Even if yeah. you have a small piece of it, right? But like right. I'm owning larger products now and I'm trying to set vision for the entire thing. And like, it's interesting because like very few people have ever done that. Like have yeah. gone into a team and or organization and set a vision plan for that entire organization. Mm -hmm. And if they're asking you to do it, that means it doesn't exist for your organization. Right. So mm -hmm. they've never seen it. And I think there's value in what you're saying because I always have to break it down in two ways. And like, like this is the secret sauce to getting your vision. It's yeah. no different than a pitch deck. If you ever have done pitching or anything like that to venture right. capital, this is the same model. You go in, you you want to get people excited up front, right? So I normally phase even this project. What is the 80% we can really show that will demonstrate our primary product, right? So I pick a right. very streamlined workflow that shows the 80% kind of golden path of how this works. And I yeah. prototype it in super high fidelity and get everyone super excited. I might make a video that shows how it integrates to people's life, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. All vaporware, all hand wavy, mm -hmm. very much mm -hmm. like those penguins from Madagascar. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I'm like, <laughs> nothing to see here, but it's super clean and it gets people super excited, right? Right. And so then devs are excited. People start talking about it and everyone now everyone thinks they're part of the vision, right? Which is, that's the play. That's yeah. the play. Like in the back, yeah. that's all you're trying to do, right? So you let that kind of boil, but nobody knows how to execute it. So there'll be a couple of weeks where everyone's hype and then they go like, oh yeah, but that's not what we have. How do we do that? Right. The only time I've had success in this is when you lay out a clear execution plan. Yes. And something I did at a very low level and was like a very insane amount of work mm -hmm. is like the last team I was on, I set a vision and it was kind of like something that I thought would be achievable three to five years from now. Yeah. I made 17 iterations of prototypes from where we are today up to where we would need to be. And I made a roadmap that went with it, right? But mm -hmm. what you need to show as a designer is it's a show not tell type of job a lot of the time. You have to yeah. talk to people, but yeah. whenever it comes to design, you're not going to be able to sit there and talk to a, a PM or an engineer about design principles like, oh, this needs to be here because of clarity and balance and, mm -hmm. and all these other things or familiarity, you know what I'm saying? Um, mm -hmm. But just showing them like hey here's all the step changes that you're gonna have to make to get there they can now right. wrap their head around it and be like oh so that's the v1 you're not asking me to build this entire thing and people much because if you just do the other one they're gonna be like oh this guy clearly doesn't understand anything about tech you know mm -hmm. what i'm saying like we can't get there today we can't just build mm -hmm. that um right. so it's you really need to show how you execute it and not just talk about it and that gives you you not you might not have to build 17 prototypes from here to there but like show <laughs> us show us the key frame from here to there points yeah exactly show me the story arc right like, and, I, and, go oh, ahead. Go well i was just saying like and yeah i think that's like that's the job of ux though that we always talk about is like we're storytellers and right. you know i think for us it's easy to be able to tell a story because we did friggin' like videography forever so it, you know right. actually writing stuff and so it's like once you would when, when you are a storyteller you have to make things compelling make them interesting build like you know yeah, put in the challenge make it make a hero out of out of this product and like you know face a 
you know, giant dragon and that's your challenge, your business challenge and your user challenge or your user goals or whatever their journey or tasks are or something like that. And you're really just their frustrations. And, you know, that's your dragon to slay and sort of like lay out a map of how you're going to train up your hero to get to that point to be able to slay that dragon. Right. The thing that's cool about what you just said, too, is like the thing that I've seen work more successfully is everyone is thinking about the product, right? They're like, oh, yeah, we need to get the product out. We need to get the best version of our product out. Mm -hmm. No one puts their lens on the team. And so much mm -hmm. of setting a vision is getting mm -hmm. your team's morale up. And yes. if you can start agreeing on dragons that it'll fix in your team, that's when you get a lot of success. So anytime I'm selling a design system or mm -hmm. trying to sell a vision, I mm -hmm. always talk to tech debt, always talk to how it's going to uh, free up the business to experiment more. I always talk to how um, the PM team will be able to add more features into more places or they'll be able yeah. to scale these other things or they'll be able to, to add in additional features here and there. So you need to go understand what the challenges are from every piece of the business. Mm -hmm. And part of your vision is fixing that. They're your customers too, right? So like your mm -hmm. entire vision might, you might not have any data or research. You might feel like you're at a, a, a loss and mm -hmm. you might not know anything that you can do for your customers. Mm -hmm. And then all you're really doing is maybe a redesign and fixing your internal problems. And then it'll be very clear things you can do for your customers over, over time as well, because yeah. people are just not understanding that when you bring business value, a lot of it is in driving clarity across organization. There you go. You know, I, I think you couldn't really hit the, hail, the nail harder on the head because I can tell you in like my previous teams that I've had that kind of experience where I've had great teams and I've had terrible teams. And <laughs> like even the great teams and the terrible teams, it's like I'm. it's not so much in that, you know, I love people or I hated people who I worked with. I had on both of those teams. One of them, I love pretty much everyone. And the other one, I, you know, definitely loved a bunch of the people that I worked with. Not everybody, but that was its own thing. But it's still like that second team where stuff wasn't really working that wasn't a good team it was because we didn't have clarity as an organization of like really what we were we had these like overarching we had these overarching goals these things we wanted to change and how we wanted to do that but we didn't have like a good we didn't have a strategy we didn't have a plan we had you know our project management framework was extremely disorganized it was all over the place there were things that you needed at earlier parts that didn't get created until later parts and stuff that in later parts was like duplicates of stuff you already did earlier and right. like you didn't know who you needed to bring in who were your stakeholders like when you need to bring in design when you needed to you know do whatever and so it's like until and i think the big problem in that team was just that we never fixed that framework right um, and so it it constantly creates a lot of churn and frankly kills the morale of your team it, uh, you know, keeps you running in circles in terms of what the work it is that you're doing and putting out and just really just putting out fires like you're yeah, really 24 seven, you rarely afforded the time and ability to like f put your focus and energy towards improving things. You're That's just trying interesting. Yeah, you're trying to fill potholes a lot of the time. That's one so, of the things that I see yeah. design being good at, too, is fixing processes like that, which is something you wouldn't yeah. think of. But like yeah. the, the thing that's interesting about that is everyone always has a nice discussion about tech debt. Right. Everyone's right. always like, oh, right. we have tech debt here and there. You know what created that tech debt? Poor processes, hey, poor planning. There you go. So like anything that you normally see such a downstream impact, like tech is so far removed from the business decisions. You have business decisions and the PMs kind of do their thing with it. Then design kind of does their thing with it. Then design's kind of working between all these different people as well. So is PM. Right. And then right. by the time a dev sees it, you're sometimes a year down the road and you're just executing on some plan, especially if you guys are doing waterfall, which teams still oh, do. Um, the team I'm on right now is kind of doing waterfall and it's really creating problems. Really? Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the fact you said really, yeah, exactly. I, I, I would have just assumed they would have been agile. I haven't worked on a team that was using agile in like three years. Yeah. And, you know, and talking about design systems and like trying to help sort of organizationally your processes uh i think one of the things that kind of really stuck out to me about like the latest team that i've joined was um ma one of the managers was saying that they cre that he created like a set of sketch files that were essentially to be used as like templates um by the designers and he, he uh not so much for the actual like wireframes themselves so much as like 
um, like helping as far as like redlining and being able to like uh, write up different comments for like why you're doing design decisions in certain areas and being able to show off multiple versions and iterations of a design to be able to show off the different aspects of those designs and sort of write to it. And basically the net effect of all he was trying to do was create a way that at the end of the design or you know, at the end of like this product launch, you'd be able to have sort of like your case study um, right. as to like, okay, here's why I did this. Here's it, what informed this. Here's why we made this decision, which is ultimately nowadays, at least what really sets apart, um, you know, senior designers from other more like production level sort of designers. Right. Yeah. That's interesting. Cause like I use so many tools to try to do that same thing and it takes a lot. I yeah. normally document stuff on wikis or like I, I use Envision a ton to see all the different versions and try to use commenting and things like that. But yeah. telling the story of your design is that sales process, right? So like yeah. if you're able to say, okay, cool. Um, Cause almost any time someone comes on your project, the first thing they want to do is brainstorm. They don't want to listen. They don't want to <laughs> hear anything that you did. They want to tell you why their idea is the way that it needs to be. And nine times out of 10, you've already explored that concept. You tested it and it didn't work. And you iterated and you tried other things. And maybe parts of that idea worked or parts of that expect, uh, like that execution helped you get to the next phase. Right. But like if somebody's coming at you that's really not a designer or a design thinker, not even a designer, you can still think deeply and not, and be, not a be a designer about these things, right? But like, right. If they're not doing that, they're giving you something that's very surface level. Like most of the time they're like, hey, Pinterest has a bottom bar like this, or I really love yeah, what Spotify say. does. Okay, great. Like I've seen it too. Um, I can use that as inspiration, but we've I also already go gone to way past that. Every day. You said what? I also go to AW Awards. Yeah, exactly. AW Awards is amazing. It's... But yeah, it's just like, it's really interesting to, to talk about design. That's why so many people like to do it. Yeah. So it's interesting that it's really cool that you're saying like, hey, he's been able to set up a framework for how to talk about design. Right. Because that if the, the positive part and like the most powerful part is if everyone else on the team that's not a designer understands how to interpret that framework, you've mm -hmm. got something. Right. Exactly. Like that's a that's a huge change. Exactly. And so I think, you know, as we've gotten further in our careers it's become you know very evident to us is like that idea of the sales pitch and the idea of just getting buy-in and collaboration from the people that you work with on these products and all these projects is uh ultimately kind of what's gonna set you on a career trajectory to being at a much more senior position much more quickly in your right. career yeah that makes a lot of sense because like i think the big difference and we can talk about this in another time but just looking at portfolios and I do a ton of interviews now, that is the key difference. Yeah. How do you explain your design decisions? I've seen designs that are effectively what you would call worse designs or mm -hmm. worse looking designs mm -hmm. with better explanation, impact and results, you know, than some of the best looking designs with no challenge, business problem or customer focus. Hell yeah. So that makes a whole difference lot of difference and i think what you're really talking about is one of the key skills in getting a job is talking about your designs too so you need to practice it <laughs> let me on a daily you. basis <laughs> yeah you do it, it i mean you know i having just sort of gone through that whole process myself it's like uh, the last time i was really looking you know having to do a lot of searching for uh for a ux design job was six years ago Yep. about six five six years ago and things have changed in that amount of time because mm -hmm. before the it this is something i alluded to earlier it's like you know before then it was really like you could get away with showing just like really cool pictures some and UI. images yeah, exactly and just like <laughs> yeah. some general ui stuff talk kind of about how you came to your decisions on those designs and you know -da -da -da, that was it like yeah but you know that that was it and nowadays it's it particularly when 
you know, you're trying to get in um, more senior, mid-level senior sort of design positions instead of like associate level introductory sort of positions. It's you have to be able to speak to that whole design process. And they want to know about like end-to-end design process. And I think when I first started seeing a lot of that in job recs, I was like, what is that? Even? Like, <laughs> right. what, what does that even mean? And it's like, oh, you want a story in terms of like, here was a problem. Here's, you know, what we did to solve it. Here's what happened along the way and why we did what we did and right. you know, what that results in. The interesting part about that and something that may not be 100% clear to people is there's a really big reason for that, right? So, like, you can't really tell through just the portfolio of what everyone did and things, but it is a better signal if you can talk to all those things. But, like, yeah. think of it more like this. People are starting to understand that UX is what differentiates their business, right? Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. one part of it. The other side to it is there's honestly not that many senior or like principal or director level, really senior, like the super senior yeah. type yeah. design people, right? Yeah. So when you start getting into more like senior interviews, you get a lot of people that aren't designers on those types of interview loops. True. So you start seeing them looking for the other pieces that designers bring to the table now. Where, oh, how did you actually solve the business problem? What metrics did you use to make sure that you solved it? Mm -hmm. Because their concerns, even if they see like really good graphical things now, they're been burned enough times to know that that doesn't sell. Cut it. Yeah, exactly. It doesn't work. Yeah. So now they're actually at the table asking you those questions, which I think is a good evolution I agree. of the practice. Yeah. The question is like, how do you retroactively make that work for everyone that's already currently in the in design? You know, yeah. and you don't, right? But right, <laughs> it's, it's one of those things where you know, unfortunately, it's like we are where we are, and it's you know, it's impossible to go back and change what's been done in that aspect without the infinity stones. Right, <laughs> you know, I can't just hit that snap real quick with the gauntlet. Like, but yeah, you know how I, many projects I'd snap away? Oh my I'm god. <laughs> So many of these just freelance projects are done. It's like, why am I here? <laughs> but yeah, you know, it's you know, we we can't undo that. And until we get to a point where we have like a legitimate UX council that you know grades people and you can get yeah. a certification from or something. The like council that. of Ricks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's like, come on, Morty. We gotta we gotta get this interface right, Morty. You know what's interesting about what you're saying is like that kind of thing kind of existed with development. Yeah. Where you had all these higher institutions that really well, uh, taught development. A lot of other industries have this. A lot of other roles within Well, tech. it's weird because now development's going the other way. Like, they're they're breaking down those walls and going back towards, like, oh, you don't need it. Like, look at Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon. They're taking, up, taking away those degree requirements. And it's like, you, if you're good at what you do, right. you do it. I Yeah. I don't mean necessarily in terms of, like, the actual, like, computer degrees. And I think that that's right. actually – I do think that's a good step. I don't think that having a college degree is – necessary to get a tech job i don't think it's necessary for to be a good developer and to do a lot of right. these things it helps and it's a good way to get trained in that but it's not necessarily indicative of too much and there's a lot of other comments I won't it's get indicative of paying a lot i was gonna say this is like you know it's a good way to put yourself in debt for a <laughs> right time, exactly but <laughs> and hope i think, I think we we know where we stand on the whole college thing here yeah that's that's its own other conversation <laughs> but youtube beyond, is college yeah right beyond that Quote it's me. like well, Don't honestly, <laughs> actually, exactly. actually, it's like you can learn how to do anything off YouTube these days. You can learn how to, you can sign up for a masterclass course for like a free for like you and another person for a year now. Or so like here's the quick question. Half off or something. I don't know. How much in, in college, how much did you learn from YouTube and how much did you learn from your professors? If you could put it on a, on a I mean, scale. In terms of things that I still use or like... <laughs> I, well, I, honestly, even in college, I learned a lot of my math from YouTube. <laughs> How much do you think you learned at all from school that you're applying to your job today? Uh, ugh, you know, I, there's a few concepts and things like that. But right. Like the technical skills. I, it's not like I'm cracking open those textbooks, bro. Like, Why is, not? <laughs> I already I think, paid for <laughs> uh, To be clear, like I tell my mom this all the time because she was a huge proponent of like the education system, which I, I can see why you go there. Like, yes. I think different people are just fit for different things. I'm not Absolutely. somebody that is good in structured environments. I do better when I'm kind of like self-taught. Right. So for me, and you know this already, but like I right. spent, I didn't even go to classes. 
I sat in my room and watched YouTube videos on the things I wanted to learn. After my first year, right? My first year, I was right. like, hey, they're teaching me calculus. I don't need to know this to do what I want to do. I wanted to make video games, right? right. Or I actually wanted to work at Pixar first, but I was yeah. like, either one, same skill. I just sat in my room and learned Maya forever and taught myself. <laughs> and I was like, day in, day out, that's what I did. I was like, hey, this is this is going to get me where I need to go, <laughs> not calculus. You know what I'm exactly. saying? And I'm like, exactly. So it's like. YouTube is the way. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> for, for people that are self starters, YouTube there's University. other options, is all I'm saying. Yeah. You, YouTube University is where it's yeah, at. You, I, you. Yeah, right. Mm-hmm. Until, you know, you would have had a job like in college had the FBI not raided your server. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot about that. <laughs> okay, Shut so everything. the FBI didn't raid my servers, first of all. <laughs> They raided Kim.com servers. I didn't know anything about Dropbox. I don't know if Dropbox existed. But like, I didn't Certainly have any not back. I back up everything on Mega Upload. <laughs> that was the worst decision of my life. The federal government has your portfolio, bro. They literally have my game development portfolio still they have everything. To, to this day. To, to this day. day. I cannot believe it. I was so, uh, I'm still mad. Yo, pray for this man, y'all. Yo, somebody get Kim.com out of prison. <laughs> That's all I've got to say. Yo, free Kim. I can't, free Kim. I can't even. I didn't even remember that until you said that. that was so I don't know bad. how you could forget that, bro. Now I'm even more mad. I'm about be. to riot in the streets. <laughs> Freekim.com. Freekim.com. Right. I want my server back. No. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I will say this. You know, I think the higher education thing is like certainly its own cop- topic of conversation. I think we both oh, have sure. opinions on design. that. But like. I think what what I'm referring to is more in like the idea of like certifications and stuff, right? Yeah, because yeah. Because certifications in in UX are non they they exist and they're all built. Like I, <laughs> I I'm sorry, but it's just they're all trash. Like I, I have yet to see anything from any of these that's like a unified sort of like oh this is a world standard as far as like what a UX designer should do and should be able to do. And right, like that. right. I, that's too I, diverse. There's too many is. diverse skill sets. And I'm like, exactly. that's the thing about design is it's kind of the most, if you were really thinking of it critically, like it's the best place to bring a lot of different diverse opinions and ideas yeah. in. Even if you don't have a lot of the solid skill sets, like everyone can design something. We all know how to design or think like designers. It's around like, doing balancing all the skills at once is what makes it difficult mm-hmm. it's like you have to be the the freaking avatar to do ux design like it's the, the master of all eight elements. Tech bending. yeah exactly and i'm like the thing that's the most um interesting to me though is a lot of people are able to do this job they're just not exposed to it and i think yeah. there's like yeah. there's yeah. a little even now we're talking we're not i'm not trying to spin it that way but like there's a little bit of elitism in the tech world where it's like oh this is my this is my ball and this is my mm. my place where i play and i'm like in reality i think we need to uh, democratize design and get it into the mm-hmm. hands of like more people and that's kind of what you're getting at i think because like yeah the whole thing with certificates is like ng like nielsen norman they have a certificate but like what is it gonna do like I, you know. it doesn't really do much like oh yeah i'm a ux i'm certified ux guy what does that do for you it's a really nice thing on your LinkedIn. That's it. That's what it is. That's right? it. It, it. I think with with UX in particular, and you know, I think with a lot of like these kind of different roles within tech, you know, it really just comes down to like, what have you done? Like, what have yeah. you? Like, what are you what doing? What can you do for me? Today? And like, you know, a lot of times, I think you go through certain courses and stuff, and they just like help you come out with a you know a bunch of different like deliverables and mockups and things like that to be able to like help you get that job, and that's great in that respect. But I and I'm not saying this as like an uh, impl- impl- as an implication against these places necessarily, or that you shouldn't go to them. But that if you're only going through them and coming out with like just stuff to put in a portfolio, as opposed to actually understanding design processes, yeah, it's different. You're setting yourself up for failure. Yeah, that is true. Because I'm like, you need to know some things that are going to be base level skills that you're going to build on and some of it is theory right but like not all of it that's the thing about design you're going to put those theories to the test really quickly right and i think that like to me the thing that was the most helpful in in any sort of learning is literally the scientific method like if you go back to fifth grade and you're like oh we're gonna make a hypothesis and test it that's design right there and if you really understand how closely mapped those things are you'll be a successful designer that's it is that is that is 
the fundamental part of that is just like test stuff out like if someone doesn't like your idea go test it out and go test it compared to theirs and see right. what works and... and feel free to execute other people's ideas that's i think i mean the whole topic of this discussion was misconceptions right right and like one of the things that's a misconception as well is exactly what you're talking about like oh i'm the designer i designed the thing right it's a collaborative thing you design with everyone and you should be okay learning that your idea was wrong and if right. you're not you're not a good designer like your idea, you're supposed to be looking for answers. That's really what you're looking for. You're looking for answers and you're trying to craft the appropriate product mm -hmm. based on the answers. You're not building Michelangelo. You're not doing art. And I'm like, if you're really taking critique poorly, especially from customers, mm. or you're not open to like trying other ideas, um, and there's a time and a place to do this. So I'm not saying always mm -hmm. do this, but I'm mm -hmm. like early in the process, you should be prototyping all kinds of ideas, testing yeah. all kinds of ideas yeah. and let your your product people come up with ideas and, and help visualize them and show them what's right and wrong from the customer feedback. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to be in debates. That's part of the selling process too is, hey, every everyone's ideas are equal and they're all, we can we can test all of them. And you right. help craft those things into to reasonable functional things right. and test them. Yeah. And now you've got the right product, but even part of that is building the trust and earning the trust. I'm like the biggest thing that I really would speak against in this whole thing I'm talking about is like, as much as you own the design, mm -hmm. and this is kind of like leadership, right? Like you might be leading the design, right? That doesn't mean you, you do every part of it and you have say over every part of it. It's like, you can delegate pieces of it out. And it's like, okay, you know what? Mm -hmm. That guy's idea can go in this part right here, but like you own how it comes together. You're like owning the, the sum of it and right. all the parts, could be other people's ideas. You don't have to be the main idea generator. You're the person that synthesizes. Even your customers are coming up with all kinds of ideas and you're synthesizing it down and executing it. That's all you're really doing. I, I, I don't think you have to go in there with this like hero mentality of like, I'm going to be the inventor that solves this right. so much as like, let me just be the person who hears out everybody, puts all that stuff together and finds a way to make it work. Yeah, it's a lot of interpreting. You're doing a lot of like decoding what people are saying and doing. Yeah, yeah. Interpreting that and then putting it back down right. and pushing it back out. Right. It's a very hard thing to explain because it's not. It's a lot of it's on intuition. A lot of it's on things you've already known. A lot of it's on things you heard. You might hear something one off. Like this is something that's another misconception. Is like mm -hmm. when you do user research, right? People look for trends a lot. Like, oh yeah, I've got all this quantity or all this qualitative data, and seven out of ten people are doing this. So many of my designs that have been like really pivotal moments have when when I go into a user test and I have like the one person that's never used it before, never used anything like it before, says something Those really random. <laughs> says something random off the wall, and I'm like, yes. I just fixate on it, and that thing makes your product so much better. Yes. And I'm like, there's so many things where it's like qualitative insights that you get. I always make this miscellaneous bucket where it's like, hey, okay, here's some of the miscellaneous feedback. And I spend most of my time crafting solutions around that <laughs> because all the other stuff is surface level. Like you knew it before you went in. Like if it's a yeah. big. I wish this were green. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like if it's a big overarching theme, you normally had an idea of it might be a problem when you went in. But if it's right. not and it's kind of this scattered data and you're like, I have a better example of this that we can go into if you're interested. But like there's. So hear. many. All right, I'll give you. An, I'll give you the example then. So essentially, I used to work on um, this fashion website, maybe what five years ago now. Yeah, that's so weird to say, but like I, <laughs> it was basically five years ago, and we had this really uh, interesting challenge. We were trying to redesign the app, and I come up with all these different ways to like browse, right? Mm -hmm. So they were they wanted us to essentially say, hey, we had we had a flash sales model at the time. Groupon was doing it living right. social oh, you right, don't even right. remember living social do you oh, yeah but all these goodness. amazon uh, had a version of it i really can't uh, remember what was it the the shop oh they were uh scout mob shop scout mob yeah scout mob, yeah, yeah, scout scout mob. mob. they were in atlanta yeah yeah, I remember yeah, yeah. That. so <laughs> so the thing that's crazy about this right is like first instinct as a designer was like okay we have this events page right and we need to integrate browsing into it. I was like, okay, I'm going to add uh, all of our customers on the event page. I'm going to find ways to add widgets into this browse page. So I had like, oh, I'm going to place widgets in this this area, that area, X, Y, Z. Um, I eventually land on this spot where I, I came up with this interactive widget where you'd have a browse widget kind of come up from the bottom. Mm -hmm. and you'd mess with it, right? Mm -hmm. I go into a usability study and I'm, I'm relying 
also on the search, right? So like, oh, the search is going to be able to work for all these other things. So essentially mm -hmm. the model I'm looking at is I had three personas. One of them is really event focused. Right. I also needed to hijack the person that's more browse focused on right. the home page because they wouldn't go anywhere else. So I made that little widget. Okay. And then I had someone that was a search focus, like a utility browser. Where I was like, hey, they might get inspired by something they saw in the event cards or in the, the browse. And then they'll search to get more information on it. Okay. Tell me why I, I meet with this one lady and I strictly remember even like sitting in the room with her. Um, she was like 35 uh, ish um, with a couple of kids. And she was mm -hmm. telling me that she used this site every day. And I started observing how she was using search. And I was just completely like blown away with how she was doing it. She was using search mm -hmm. to kind of search different terms. She would literally go look at Google or go look at Amazon and find stuff that she was interested in and come in and start searching the terms and save them in in her recent search history, right? She okay. wouldn't actually analyze any of this stuff. She would, right. she would kind of like keyword this stuff together and she'd come back to it later and she'd look, hit all the different keywords and then start try to piecemeal uh, which item is best. And she was doing this to shop for kids' toys. So she would go look at kids' toys okay. on Google or Amazon. She'd type right. in a name of it, see if we had right. it, and then try to cross-reference things, right? And then she'd do this over a period of time of like, oh, I'm going to see if they have enough information. Then she'd if we didn't have enough information, she'd go look it up on Amazon, then cross-reference the prices, all these things, right? So, like, I was watching her use search in this really awkward way yeah, where she was essentially tagging stuff that she wanted to look that at later. Was, right, right. right. Like and it so Pinterest, it's almost. almost like a wish list or a Pinterest board or something like that, but yeah. it was more awkward because she was, like, diving into them, like, quick viewing them, coming out of them, like, saving specific details in a the notepad. Jumping between apps. And... Yeah, it was nuts, dude. And I was like, what is she doing? And I started, like... I was in an observer room when she was doing this, so I didn't want to yeah. interrupt her. I was just trying to watch. Mm -hmm. And I went in and tried to ask her, like, hey, what's going on? Because I couldn't 100% interpret what was going on. I was like, okay, what are you, what are you trying to accomplish here? Mm -hmm. And she starts talking about, like, hey, you know what? My kid has an allergy. He has an allergy to specific... Um, like I plastics think, or materials plastic, or something. something like that. It was like uh, maybe paint types or something. And he, yeah. she was looking for details that we just didn't have because they were really, really granular. And so she was huh. trying to make filters personally off of the brands that she knew had like deeper, uh, you know what I'm saying? Like they were more yeah. organic or they had, uh, they wouldn't, they had, they, had, they didn't whatever. have this kind this kind of stuff in their process, in yeah. their products and they didn't do this kind of stuff to it. Right. Right. And then she, so she was doing that and then trying to make like this brand tracking thing. And then long story huh. short, we came up with this product idea a few and it, we kind of started there, but it cross-referenced with other people where I saw right. a lady doing a similar thing on the website mm -hmm. where she was looking up Prada bags, right? So we had high-end fashion on our site, right? right? She was looking up Prada bags and she would go to forums and cross-reference like how much is this Prada bag worth because we had discounted Prada bags. And she'd mm. talk to people on the forum. She'd cross-reference to see if they're fake, see how to check them, all these things. And then she wanted to mm. follow. She would tell me like, oh, she wanted to follow certain brands. Like, oh, I know I'm going to follow Balenciaga, Prada, blah, blah. Right, and right. I have to go do all these searches. So long story short, cross-referencing those two anecdotes and some, some other things, mm -hmm. we ended up making this branding, like this brand tracker feature where you can, huh. once you search a brand or you... Put in a couple like, of filters. You could you, save if, if brands. something you look for multiple times. Or yeah, if you look like for that. multiple times or up front, you know kind of what you're lo looking for. You could pick mm -hmm. some brands and isolate your searches or even like your entire event feed based mm -hmm. on those brands, right? And that's one of those deeper things that you just find in one-off conversation that I would have never known that I wasn't even testing for that. I was testing for something yeah. completely different. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, That's now awesome. we have this brand tracker, right? And it's one of the cool things. Like, there's so many stories I have like that where it's like, hey, we just made a, and it was a product pivot. Nobody had something like that at the time. Um, we kind of tested. I've seen other people do it since then. I mean, it, yeah. There's even it's something on Amazon right on now Amazon. that uses that, but it's built off the same technology we used then. So it's this really awkward. There's so many weird findings like that, that if you really pay attention to what people are saying and interpret, what they're they're trying to do you have really huge nuggets of like quality product that are sitting in even one person's feedback right right wow nuts that is nuts okay so what <laughs> <laughs> oh wow okay i think with that said we will end the conversation on that point uh i know we certainly drifted away from the main topic. <laughs> the primary topic. you yeah, want to yeah. go back to it real quick and i'll just ask you the one if when you first <laughs> When you <laughs> drinking, notes. I'm gonna. In, I think uh, I'm gonna ask you this. 
if there was one misconception that you could have known prior to starting your career, what would you have liked to know? Mm, misconceptions in terms of like things that I miss miscon- I I view a misconception like other people view a misconception. Whatever you think, like uh, any misconception, maybe the ones like maybe misconceptions you had about UX. You know, I th- I will admit that I think um, for a minute my view on UX was more in terms of sort of like what those deliverables were. And I think that like those are, I still admit, those are still some of my favorite parts of doing UX. It's like coming up with wireframes and prototypes right. and like sketching and stuff like that. Um, and just thinking that that's really all it was, but not understanding um, UX is so much larger than that. And when you actually start getting to a point of like system design, thinking and really trying to like map out and understand like what does this thing on this one page do um that affects the journey like three pages later there was um there was something i was told by a teammate of mine where it was something basically when i was like really early in my career uh, the effect was like you know if you don't just focus on the page that you're designing think of the page before that Think of the page after that. Think of like the different states that uh, go on beyond the place that you're actually working on, and you're that fe- that one feature you're trying to update or do something with, and really make sure that you're thinking from like start to finish. Where does this fit in amongst so many other things and so many other factors? In, in that particular example, I remember it was related to this, like upsells uh, right. in a particular program. And so, you know, by the time they reached, uh, I think it was like, you know, like something like a product page. I I think there had been like two or three upsells on like this particular program. And then there were like three more after that fact. And so you're just like, if you're just throwing upsells at people like page after page after page, that's just going to build resentment. That's not going to get clicks in (laughs) or quality, you know, quality. uh, Even if it does get clicks, it's not helpful, right? exactly and so you know that that's my biggest misconception was this idea that like you were focused i was so focused on just the one page right um you know focus on the tree for the forest i guess yeah yeah that makes sense yeah so you know that's me but cam what's your biggest misconception about ux that you want to correct for you know i'll keep this pretty short but it's interesting and i think you kind of touched on it a second ago um with something that you were explaining but it's pretty obvious if you think about this, but as someone that was entering design, I thought I'd be working on nothing but consumer products and like flashy, interesting things. Yo. And you're not always doing that, right? You're working on the ads or the upsells, or I've been working on a lot of builder tools and things like that. I've worked in internal games, platforms, internal platforms, right? And uh, yeah, like fall in love with the problems. That's really what I'm getting at. A, a lot of the flashy, cool products, like, yeah, you can make them, but there's a lot of politics around that. There's there's a lot of cost to doing that. Mm-hmm. And if that's your your game, then go that direction. But not the majority of things that need design aren't those flashy, cool products. Yes. So, yeah, that's kind of my biggest misconception is you can make something into one of those flashy, cool products, but that's not where they start. And that's not where the jobs are. You know, the jobs right. are in the things that have the grimy, bad workflows and they need fixing. And if yeah. you can really fall in love with like, deep hard problems and like making them simple yeah that's where you're going to succeed as a designer yeah so Uh, i think that's like my biggest and i i think i'm really grateful for that because like i i like the problem solving aspect of a lot of other things like the Mm -hmm. the technical stuff or even like doing films or anything yeah and i didn't understand how much problem solving was going to be in design until i started it right you know so that's my biggest thing all right cool yeah so with that, I guess we'll go ahead and wrap up here. You have anything else you want to say, Kalen? Uh, nothing too much. Just to say that we are, in fact, dim boys. <laughs> we keep it on and popping. We dim boys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we got to figure out how often we're going to do this, but we'll definitely keep this coming on a regular cadence. We're going to be figuring out a lot of things. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully we help you figure out a lot of things too. Yeah. You know, we're all figuring stuff out these days. Right. That's what all of 2020 has been. Hey. So we'll keep it going. 
All right. Well, cool. Well, thank you, everybody, for listening, joining in with us today. And uh, we'll catch you all next time. Catch you on the flip side. Peace. Bye. <laughs> 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 you caught me slipping. <laughs> what? Uh.